So let's just dive right into the news. Uh, last week, of course, the big news was that the Fed made a pretty steep interest rate hike. Uh, and that, of course, has spawned fears that we might be heading toward a recession. And I wanted to get your, your take on this because, um, you know, I, I have heard some progressive economists kind of pushing back against the idea that we might be headed toward a recession and saying, well, you know, we actually shouldn't uh, overstate the power of the central bank, right? So uh, I suppose the first question for you is, um, what effect do you think the interest rate hike will have? Uh, and how likely is it that we are actually heading toward a new recession? Okay, um, the interest rate hike will definitely hurt everybody who has to borrow money one way or another because it makes that activity more expensive. You get the same amount of a loan, but the interest you're going to have to come up with every year uh, while you carry that loan is going to be higher. So you are out money. If you've been hurt by the inflation, you will now, in addition, be hurt by higher interest rates. And to make it clear, if you want to buy a new or used car, uh, the vast majority of Americans do that by buying on time, stretching the payments out over three, four, five, six years. A uh, higher interest rate means that for the exact same car purchased for the exact same price, your monthly payment will have to be significantly larger this week than it would have been if you bought the car two weeks ago. Um, ditto if you want to buy a home. Uh, if you're going to take out a loan, which we call a mortgage, that will now be more expensive. If you have a credit card balance, you're going to discover that they can raise whatever it is uh, their interest rate is last week. They can make it higher this week, and that'll show up in a bigger minimum monthly payment that you have to make on that, and so on and so forth. You also face the fact that many corporate entities... Uh, are deeply in debt. Uh, corporations in America today are in greater debt than they have ever been in the history of this country because we've had 20 years of very low interest rates during which every capitalist enterprise uh, solved any problem it had. A bad technology, poor choice of product, conflict with their workers, whatever it was, the quickest, easiest uh, cheapest way of solving the problem was to go borrow money at virtually zero or very close to zero interest rates. Because they're so indebted, as these debts become due, what most companies do is you know, say we owe a billion dollars uh, and uh, 200,000 of it have to be paid by the end of July. Well, what you, what you do normally is you quote unquote roll over the debt. You don't pay it back. You go through a ritual within a 10 minute period. You technically pay back uh, the, the 200,000 you owe but immediately borrow it back again so that you don't actually have to come up with it. You literally, you're extending the loan, but you will have to do that at the new higher interest rate compared to last time. So carrying an already existing debt is becoming more uh, costly to a corporation. And if it can, it will pass on that cost to the mass of people. So long story short, this is going to hurt everybody who is in debt or who does business with an entity that is in debt because the chances are part of that debt you're going to be required uh, to pay, uh, number one. Number two, it doesn't reduce the uncertainty of the economy because no sooner was the interest rate raised by three quarters of a percent then everybody who knows how this game is played began speculating on what's going to happen at the July meeting. Will they raise interest rates again? And you have to now strategize, and it's all a gamble because you can't know, whether to take all kinds of steps now to protect yourself against an interest rate which may or may not come. And because that's a gamble and, uh, you know, what we call a crapshoot, basically, uh, we have no idea how to answer your question. That is, there's no way to know how long this is going to last, how high the interest rates are going to go. And then the big question, what will be the uh, cumulative impact, say, by the end of this year of whatever interest rates are increased and whatever reactions uh, people and businesses take, whether that will end up with a recession or not, 
at this point, the odds are going up literally every day that we will have a recession so that the speculation has already within the last week moved over from will we have one? More and more, the question is, how bad will it be? That is, right. how long will it last and how deep will it cut? Mm -hmm. So that that brings up the question, you know, the Biden administration, I think, has been their line has kind of been like trust the Fed. Right. But yes. I, I, I'm now wondering, you know, what do you think the Biden administration can do to prepare for this likely upcoming recession. Um, Biden, of course, you know, as as a former member of the Obama administration has presided over a recession before. Uh, what should what steps should the Biden administration be taking? Well, the first thing is, let me comment briefly for Mr. Biden to have reappointed Mr. Powell was a bizarre thing for a Democrat to do. Mm. Number one, and then to have said, as he did literally a, a week or two ago, that he's leaving it to the Fed uh, to manage this is, it, I mean, for me, it's a dereliction of duty. I mean, what do we need Democrats for if they're going to cede something as fundamental as economic policy during an inflation <laughs> to the other party? I mean, mm -hmm. the joke that they're two wings of the same party is literally be becoming reality a a as we talk about it. I find that amazing. But it goes together with, and this is the real answer to your question, it goes together with a unanimity across Republicans and Democrats about interest rate increases as being literally the only thing we can do. That's why they, Mr. Biden's is okay with Mr. Powell, because they both agree that's what they're going to do. Just like they both agreed, uh, starting back in the crash of of 2000, the so-called dot-com crash, they agreed that loosening monetary policy, what was later called uh, quantitative easing and so on, was the thing to do. I find this bizarre because it is contrary to the basic curriculum that is taught in most American universities who at least give lip service to the fact that there are multiple ways of dealing with an inflation and that raising interest rates by no means was, nor is it today, the universal agreed upon necessary policy. It's none of those. So let me give you just two examples of what else could be done. And rather than spin you uh, hypothetical, I'm going to give you two examples from American history when uh, in one case a Democrat and in the other case a Republican did something else, either to stop an inflation already underway or to prevent one from starting. So I'll begin with the latter. Richard Nixon, conservative, Republican, president, 1971, August 15th, gets on radio television, announces a wage price freeze. Here's what it means. As of tomorrow morning, says the president, as president, if you raise your price as a business, we will arrest you and we will throw you in jail. So I advise you, don't do it. If you're a worker or a union, if you press for rising wages, we will do the same. There will be no change in wages or prices so that we bring this inflation to a halt. I didn't make this up. This is the history. Go check it. Anyone can. The inflation stopped on a dime. It is an alternative that doesn't require raising a single interest rate by a single basis point. It's just not the case that doing what we're doing is the only thing you can do. And by the way, other countries have done exactly the same thing. Uh, it's called an incomes policy in some countries, uh, but it's a, a, it amounts to basically uh, the same thing. Here's my second example. This time it's a Democratic president, Franklin Roosevelt. It's the early 1940s. The United States is gearing up to fight a war. It's already in World War II. Here's the problem that the economists advising Mr. Roosevelt explained to him. We are now shifting resources in America from producing consumer goods to producing for the war. We have a serious war with uh, 
uh, Germany and Italy and Japan, and we have to shift uh, railroads and factories and offices and warehouses from doing what they always did to produce consumer goods to instead producing munitions, uh, uniforms for the soldiers, and all the rest. Therefore, there's going to be a sudden drop in the supply of consumer goods. But there isn't going to be a stop in demand for them because our population hasn't shrunk uh, and people haven't drastically altered their consumption patterns. They're still going to want to have a cup of coffee and they're going to want a gallon of gas in the car to go to shopping or to their job or whatever. Uh, so we got a classic problem. Demand remaining the same, supply drastically curtailed. If we allow the normal market mechanism to manage this situation, we're going to see a rollicking inflation because the people who demand, seeing the shelves uh, empty from the consumer goods, will start bidding up the price so that the relatively scarce consumer goods end up in their hands rather than in the hands of someone else. It, the bidding will begin and it'll solve the problem the way markets always do. Whatever is scarce in a market is ends up in the hands of the richest people. It doesn't square with any morality I'm familiar with, but we celebrate the market in this country. It is, in fact, the closest we have to a genuine as opposed to pretend uh, religion. Uh, Roosevelt says, oh, my God, we can't do that because then middle income and poor people will be enraged as they watch rich people walk off with scarce consumer goods. The wealthy family will get the milk whose price they've built a bit up and give it with enjoyment to their cat. Whereas the neighbor who has five babies in the household will be unable to afford the high priced milk and the babies will have to do without. This is going to produce bitterness, anger, envy, and social division, which is not good for fighting a war. So what did Mr. Roosevelt do? He said, we are not going to use the market to get to sell uh, scarce consumer goods. That's not fair. That's not equitable. And that's a policy running counter to the solidarity a war requires. So I'm going to produce ration books, and I'm going, I as president, and I am going to distribute them to the American people, and we're going to explain to the local grocery store, anyone who comes in here with uh, money to buy milk will be told you don't get any. The only way you get milk is if you have a ration stamp, which literally you tore out of the ration book that had been given to you by the government. You could then pay the money, but only if you were eligible by virtue of the uh, ration cards. And they were set up in such a way that prices wouldn't go up because the limited supply would be accounted for by the number of people who had the requisite stamp. No inflation developed. The unity of the United States was maintained. And that was more than a little bit important to winning the, the Second World War. Uh, so no inflation was even allowed to get going under this system. It effectively made the whole price mechanism irrelevant uh, for a period of time. You know, John Kenneth Galbraith, a famous American economist uh, with whom I studied for a while, wrote a famous book early in the 1950s called The Theory of Rationing, uh, The Theory of Price Control. And, and it was a standard book to be read by the people who wanted to understand why and how an inflation was dealt with in this manner. Knowing this, I have to then tell you that the conversation we are having officially in this country among pundits, mainstream media, Republicans and Democrats is an example of extreme as well as selective amnesia. People are proceeding as if we have to do this thing. And yet this thing 
if I can put it in perspective for you, we've just subjected the American working class to the worst public health failure in the history of the United States. Uh, we've lost a million people. You know, the, China is four times larger than us. It currently lists 20,000 people dead. I mean, the difference is so staggering. You kind of, you have to sit down and take a breath. We've also had the second worst economic collapse since the Great Depression. Uh, more than half our labor force has been unemployed uh, for at least a while over the last 18 months. Then we hit them with an inflation, and now we're about to whack them in the nose with a recession. I mean, this is a level of abuse of your own people that will come back, I am very confident, to haunt this society. It's already dividing it in ways that are frightening to most of us, but it will go much further. And part of the reason is this bizarre need to think as though the only way to solve the problem uh, of our inflation is to rack up the interest rates extraordinary. If you like this video from The Jacobin Show, please hit like and subscribe and share with your friends. Thanks.